medicine and science is run by human beings, so there'll always be crooks. It's not my job to be popular, no, <laughs> I'm very clear about that. When you know you can get away with something, and you know that the stakes are pretty high, you're going to try and do it. I like pointing out bullshit. Um, I think it's both fun and useful. Sometimes I'll feel threatened. There's been a few times when I've wanted to stop. So yes, it takes courage. This is the story of three science crusaders in different cities, on different continents, independently fighting against the same dark forces. Together, they form a kind of fraud squad, each in their own way determined to clean up bad science. They are polluting the scientific record. That's already started. That's already happened. Shining the light on parts of science that not a lot of people want light shown on uh, is a pretty important thing. These are unsettling days for scientific research. There is a retraction epidemic underway. Hundreds of research papers are being pulled from the scientific record. At the same time, questions are being raised about the reliability of study findings. In fact, it's been estimated that much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may be simply untrue. It's a global problem. In London, Fiona Godley is editor of the BMJ, one of the world's most prestigious scientific journals. That's too, uh, that's too dense, I don't really think. She's also one of science's fiercest critics. It is a very tricky balance to take because there are people who would say, don't question, don't, don't criticize, don't share your skepticism. All it will do is create doubt in the public's mind about science. We want them to believe science. We want them to base their decisions on science. We want them to trust it. Uh, my view is that actually that's a dangerous approach. Because bad science can be dangerous. Patients do get hurt. I mean, we know that. Patients get hurt uh, because um, clinical trials are um, done wrongly. Clinical trials are, are wrongly reported. Uh, science is over-interpreted. Drugs that shouldn't be available are available. And it was a very tricky case to, to do. Um, Godley was at the center of one of the most infamous cases of scientific misconduct, the vaccine autism scandal. They took their children to be vaccinated, and then something happened. Their children fell apart. It began when scientist Andrew Wakefield claimed to show that a childhood vaccine caused autism. The paper, published in a competing journal, triggered international panic. Vaccination rates fell and measles began to rise. I'm really glad we did it. We published then Godley published evidence of Wakefield's research misconduct and commercial conflicts of interest. And the impact, as we know, has been uh, measles epidemics, uh, vaccine, um, anti-vaccine um, attitudes growing, not only affecting MMR vaccine, but also affecting other vaccines around the world. So I think the impact has been substantial. We knew the story, and, and if we hadn't published it, we would have become um, complicit, really, in... Uh, For Godley, commercial interests are one of the most corrupting forces in science. Well, we had a, a special feature about... With a gift for theatre, she put this puppet on the cover of one issue to illustrate the way science's strings are pulled by the hidden hand of the pharmaceutical industry. So the strings attached is a rather clumsy way, but I think in some ways quite delightful way of hammering that point home. And he sits at my desk um, and reminds me that this is a problem that science and medicine still have and we need to keep on raising it and bringing it to the public's attention. I think of myself as a doctor, I still do. Godley started out as a family doctor and she believes she's still taking care of patients by fighting for better medical evidence. And she's not the only one. In New York City, Ivan Aransky is on the hunt for bad science. He too trained as a doctor, but he decided to write about medicine rather than practice it. His mission is to track the recall of tainted research. He started a blog called Retraction Watch, and he depends on whistleblowers to help him expose science's dirty secrets. People leak us things, people send us documents, 
Uh, we get reports from universities that aren't really supposed to be, see the light of day, and we publish them or do what we can with them. Sometimes it's been an honest mistake, but most of the time studies are retracted because of misconduct, including plagiarism and faking data. It's been happening as long as scientists have been doing science. For decades, there have been people, one of, one of whom actually painted with a magic marker on a mouse in an elevator on the way up to give a presentation to make it look as though his results were actually what he wanted everybody to think they were. That was William Summerlin who colored his mouse with a marker. And he has lots of company in the rogues gallery of scientific misconduct. Here's Wang Wu Suk, the South Korean scientist who thrilled the world saying he'd cloned human embryonic cells. Except he didn't. He made it up. There's John Darcy, the Harvard cardiologist who can claim dozens of faked papers based on data from experiments he never did. Over here, UK doctor Malcolm Pierce claiming a world first by reversing a miscarriage, except the patient didn't exist. That's the guy who plagiarized the paper about plagiarism. And meet Dong Pyu Han, who faked a vaccine experiment by spiking his rabbit samples with human blood. And so when confronted, Han confessed, felt terrible about it, uh, but eventually um, you know, lost his job. Uh, long story short, is now serving a, an almost five-year uh, prison sentence because it was federal grant fraud. Okay, so what else do we have working for this one? These retraction watchers love science, and they believe most scientists are self-governing to high standards of integrity. But when science goes sour, it can have serious repercussions, especially when flawed studies are never corrected and remain on the scientific record. A lot of this research is funneled into uh, drugs, devices, uh, other sort of ways we understand the universe. Uh, there are people who end up in clinical trials based on these results. There are people who are in clinical trials that turn out to be fraudulent. Uh, people should care about that. It seems people do care. Retraction Watch now gets 150,000 different readers every month. On the edge of the Rocky Mountains in downtown Denver, Colorado, in the middle of the university campus, at the back of the library, past some other cubicles, next to the window, there he is. It's Jeffrey Beal, academic librarian and scientific super sleuth, quietly battling the dark forces of what he calls predatory publishing. It is falling apart. It's completely falling apart. You can publish anything you want in a scientific journal or a scientific appearing journal and say anything you want, and it will have the imprimatur of science. And a lot of people are being fooled by it. How to spot a predatory publisher? They often have grandiose names but the mailing address is a post office box in a faraway place. The website will mimic a real journal complete with an editorial board, but sometimes the people named on the board don't know they're listed or they don't exist. And the first sign of the predatory publisher is a spam email, sometimes with spelling mistakes, asking the scientist to submit their research even if the scientist is in a completely different field. Despite the claims, there is no peer review, and when it all shows up online, junk science ends up masquerading as legitimate research. And then there's the fee. It comes later, and it's often a shock to the scientist. It's four in the morning. The emails are coming in from all over the world. It's evidence of a second problem with predatory publishing. Not only is bad science sneaking onto the public record, good scientists are being trapped, tricked into thinking they've submitted their work to a legitimate journal. People submit a paper to a predatory journal, later realize it's predatory, ask to withdraw it. They refuse to withdraw the paper, and they basically hold the paper hostage. Sometimes the stories are real heartbreaking. It's a dark business fueled by the scientist's need to publish or perish. A predator's offer can be tempting. This list has two columns and one column That's why Beale publishes this, 
Beale's List, a catalog of problem publishers. Wow. So we're still in the ease. With more than 1,000 titles so far and growing. Jeffrey, we need you in. Hi, good evening. My name is Marty Otanias. Welcome to another episode of Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, we have a special guest here, Jeffrey Beale, Associate Professor. Beale does what he can to sound the alarm. Here he is on a local internet talk show dedicated to the science of marijuana. I'm really excited to be with him to talk about predatory journals and cannabis studies. In the short term, you might have, get published and get credit for it, but in the long term, it can be very damaging to the Tula researcher's career. Uh, because it can make him or her look bad. Back in the UK, Godley understands the power of these driving forces. Reputations are at stake, and millions of dollars are on the line. It is corruption of the, of the scientific process, um, and it happens both through uh, commercial interest, as I've said, drug companies, device companies, um, academic institutions unwilling to confront fraud in medical research and individual academics who have their own uh, agendas, their, their own careers, their own he uh, closely held passionate beliefs which do affect, and there's endless evidence to show this, do affect the outcome of that research. But she has a solution, transparency. She calls on science to open up its data, declare its conflicts, and admit its mistakes. The public are intelligent and, and should be kept aware of the uh, uncertainties around scientific conclusions and really begin to understand uh, the problems that science faces in terms of giving really, really resilient and, and reliable results. For Ivan Oransky in New York, a typical day means reporting on at least one or two new retractions. He knows science is ultimately a search for truth, with much uncertainty along the way. Uh, what we want to do is normalize this process of scientific self-correction so that people are not afraid to acknowledge they made mistakes uh, and not feel the need to commit misconduct or fraud. If somebody can find a better way to do what I'm doing, I would love it if they could find a better way to do it. Because being a crusader for science isn't easy. Yes, it takes courage, um, but courage is a great value. And, and so I want to be courageous to the, to, as best I can. In the meantime, it's a lonely fight against the same corrupting forces in science that plague every other human endeavor. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Denver, Colorado.